television audience, I want to personally extend an invitation to you, those of you who watch us faithfully that may not have a church home. Maybe you've never joined a local church, or maybe you're in between a place to call your church home. Join us Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, April 16th at 10 a.m. I promise you, the Resurrection Day service at Nehemiah Christian Center is going to be phenomenal. We have a musical guest that will lead us into worship, Psalmist Joyce Obi. Oh my God, she is phenomenal. She is anointed to lead people into the presence of God. And then also our choir, our praise team will be uh, ministering that day. Our dance team will be performing. And I'll be preaching a transformative word from the Lord. God has given me a message. I'm going to be starting a new series that day that I believe is going to be powerful and impactful for your lives. So if you are looking for a place to worship, to bring your entire family, your children, your teens, uh, your spouse, uh, your college students, I promise, Nehemiah Christian Center, Resurrection Day 2017, April 16th at 10 a.m. will be the place for you. We're going to have some giveaways uh, for some of our guests. Uh, and so we just want you to come and experience the power and presence of God as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the high and holy day of the Christian faith. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, we would not be saved. So if you're looking for a place to join, a place to fellowship, a place to be a part of, come. Be my special guest. Turn your Bibles to the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Once again, a very familiar passage of scripture, one that you've probably heard and dealt with at least one other time before. Matthew 26, beginning at verse number 36. And the word reads as follows. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. I want to continue in our series on growth uh, with part number five, and I want to entitle our time together, Praying Through It. Praying Through It. Growth enables one to do things they previously want, were unable to. As you grow taller, you can reach things you couldn't before. As you grow stronger, you can lift things you couldn't previously. 
As you grow wiser, you handle things better than in the past. As you grow in maturity, you can do more than you were allowed to before. Growth provides new opportunities. Look at somebody and tell them growth provides new opportunities. But new opportunities also present new challenges, and these new challenges must be addressed. This requires learning how to grow even in your prayer life. Too few Christians grow in their prayer life equal to the growth they desire in their natural lives. Everybody knows how to ask God for more of stuff, more money, more responsibility, better job. But have we ever stopped to consider that the more we're asking for might require more in our prayer lives? My, my. Too many Christians struggle to grow because they fail to, to pray through difficulty. Jesus models for us uh, models for us the method of praying through your own struggles with purpose. That is what he's dealing with in our text. He's, he knows that he has come to earth to die on the cross for sinful humanity. Uh, it is something he has volunteered to do in our place. Look at Philippians 2, 7 and 8. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus is willing to come down out of heaven, as the old preacher would tell you, through 40 and two generations. Wrapped in human flesh, born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothing. Some of you didn't know what swaddling clothing was until you saw the Christmas play with the baby doll wrapped up in some tight white sheets. Lord have mercy. Wrapped in swaddling clothing, laid in a manger. And he does this voluntarily in order to take our place. And he does this. He agrees to leave the wonders of heaven to come to a sinful earth. And even though Jesus volunteers to do this, as we approach uh, the closer of the day of the crucifixion, he's dealing with struggling about his purpose. I, I, I know I know you're deep and you're sanctified, but the reality is there are some times in which the things God is speaking to you, when he first says them, you hear them and you might say yes. But when it gets closer to reality, it begins to make you question, Lord, did I really hear you? Lord, were you really talking to I mean, if, if, if anybody ever been there before, you, when, when there was distance between what he said and what you were to do, you were saying, yes, Lord, from the bottom of my heart to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord, completely yes. My soul said, I mean, you were lying it like it was a hymn in a good old traditional old folk, wood floor, wooden pew, stomp your foot kind of church. Lying in the hymn, but the closer you got to that reality, you found yourself struggling with is what is my yes today the same yes I had before. Jesus is human. He is not just divine, he's human, and he struggles. The closer he gets to the fulfillment of purpose, he struggles. Uh, as the time for fulfillment of purpose approaches, Jesus is met with a challenge. Regardless of who you are, there are times when doing what's right is difficult. 
know. I know you got a big Bible. I know you pray every day. I know you got a cross tucked away in your pocket over your chest, over your heart. I know. I know everybody at church, everybody at work knows that you are sanctified Sally and sanctified Sam. I know. But there's a time in which doing right becomes difficult. It's, it's difficult to navigate. And our text places Jesus praying through just such inner turmoil. He's praying through inner worry. And maybe I would even argue he's praying through fear. In our text here in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, we see an awful struggle of the soul taking place in an enclosed garden in a deeply shadowed and moonlit grave called Gethsemane. It's interesting that the place where Jesus is going to deal with the inner turmoil and fear is not out in the open, but in a secluded place. I need you to let that settle. He, he deals with inner turmoil in a secluded place. All right, one more time for those that might have missed it. He deals with inner turmoil in a secluded place. Jesus does not, oh God, he does not go immediately to social media to post the difficulty that he's feeling internally. He, he does not, he does not immediately pick up the phone and call his crew and tell them, y'all know I'm going through. He deals with this in a secluded place. Some of us would do ourselves great service if we stop letting all of our inner turmoil bleed into public space. He he deals with this at Gethsemane. Gethsemane was a garden at the foot of the Mount of Olives where the product, the olives of the mountain would be put through a process in order to make them into oil. Gethsemane come really means the oil press. There's a struggle for Jesus in a place of pressing. He's, he's dealing with something in a place that is meant to be a place of pressing. I, I need you to get this. He's dealing with his inner turmoil, but he does it in a place that is meant for the pressing of things. He who knew no sin, who became sin for us, is struggling with purpose. The Bible lets us know he enters into Gethsemane and as he enters in, he separates the disciples. He leaves the nine back at the forepart of the, of the garden and he takes his inner circle with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. See, when you're dealing with things, you need to know who you can trust and who you can depend upon. It's, it's a problem when you take, Lord have mercy, outside folk into inside situations. You, it's a problem when you take people who are not conditioned into places they cannot handle. Because when you take people into places they cannot handle, it is just merely, a, uh, it's merely time before the pressure of what they were not conditioned for will cause them to explode and even lose their own mind. Lord have mercy. Not, not everybody is conditioned to handle what's going on in your life. And, 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 and here's the reality, Paulson. Some people are with you but still not prepared. 
Notice he separates all the disciples and he only takes three of them. Lord have mercy. I, I wonder if maybe some of your own family is not conditioned and prepared to handle what you're dealing with. You, you, I know y'all looking at me like I'm strange. I see your mind spinning right now. Your mind's trying to process, do you have the right crew? Because let me tell you this, I've come to realize, uh, Minister Frank, that the, some of the folk who do the most barking about ride or die really ain't about that life. <laughs> I, I'm in the wrong place. I know, I know y'all don't want to. I ain't talking about your friend. I'm talking about people I know. But the folk who spend most of their time barking, I'm with you. We, we doing this thing. I'm, you know, we ride or die. They're ride or die on conditions. Their, their ride or die as long as the tires are still good. Their ride or die as long as it's still a luxury vehicle that gets attention. Good God. But when it's, when it's an outdated but yet luxury vehicle, they, 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 they start, stop being ride or die. And ride or die folk are those who when your tire goes flat, they don't mind helping you push to get out of the road. But see, some of these ride or die folk, Mother McAway, they want to stay in the car and get hit in the middle of the street. No, 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 no. If you're really with me, you'll help me get out of danger and you'll recognize that this is part of your role and responsibility in my life. Jesus has Peter, James, and John. He says, these three, Lynn, they can do a little bit more than the other nine. Let me take them inside. Now, what's interesting to me, Cornell, Deacon Harris, that I've never, uh, because we have no, uh, no storyline about it, but I've always wondered how did the other nine feel? Having been left out, how did they feel? I, I don't know. So I peradventure I'd have to propose that, that some of them were all right and some of them didn't like it. But I would argue that the lateness of the hour probably allowed the nine who were left to soon get over that they were left because they could chill. Oh, the Bible says Jesus enters. He goes in, and as he goes in, even though he has his three inner circle brothers with him, the text says he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Now, when you find yourself troubled and deeply in distress, this is not the time for you to get up and pace the floor. This is not the time for you to get up and start to develop ulcers and go into a depression. This is the time for you to go to God in prayer. It's, it's, it, it's amazing how many Christians go to God as a last result. We, we, we go to God when we've tried other things. Jesus began to be troubled and deeply distressed. This lets us know, Makita, that he's dealing with something that is troubling his spirit, troubling the core, his soul, troubling who he is. And what does he do? He models for us that when you are troubled, go into prayer I know y'all oh yeah that's just how it is I know I know going to pray but see if that's your perspective you don't really know how to pray because when you really know how to pray to, to be told to go into prayer begins to resonate with you because you know from experience that prayer helps you deal with the troubling of your soul has anybody ever been confused about some stuff? Your soul is troubled. This one left you. This one lied on you. This one cut you. This one fired you. This one you're mad at and your soul is troubled. But prayer has a way of easing and soothing the savage beast. 
<laughs> ah, because I'll tell you one thing, and this is free. You don't have to pay for this one. The truth of the matter is, it's hard to stay mad at people you're interceding for. I see. See, prayer is not just about you praying for your breakthrough, but sometimes you've got to come to the revelation that 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 in order for this thing to get better, I may have to help pray them through their foolishness. All right, I'm in the wrong church here. Sometimes you've got to pray them until they change. Lord, have mercy. Your prayer is for them so that you can keep your peace of mind. And I come to let you know that people you are sincerely interceding for are not people you can stay mad at for long. Woohoo! Somebody feel exposed now because you realize, good God, I'm mad at them. And that means you haven't been interceding for them because when you're interceding for somebody, you're cheering for them to change. You're interceding for them. You're cheering for them to win. You're cheering that they come on through. And so when I'm interceding for you, I want you to get beyond what's making you crazy. Lord, I I don't have no help in here. My interceding for you is I'm interceding that what has you salty will be washed out so that your saltness will not drive me crazy. So I'm praying that God will wash you with his words so much so that all the salts get washed out your life. Y'all don't like that kind of talking. Look at a neighbor and say, intercede, intercede, intercede. Tell somebody else, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Remember that old song, somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. Then we come in and said, I'm so glad they prayed. Then we have one line, mama prayed for me, had me on her mind. Took, see, that's that intercession that has you saying, even when I'm mad, I'm yet going to God on your behalf. Oh, and so Jesus is dealing with this. He's dealing with this reality. And the text says he separates the nine from the three from the nine. And he goes into the garden. And then he becomes greatly troubled and distressed. But then the text says he leaves the three. And he goes a little bit farther. Notice this. He, he, he's recognized that not all 12 can roll with him to this place. But now he's also recognized that sometimes even your inner circle cannot do what you've got to do for yourself in the presence of God. It's good to have people who can help you. But uh, there are some places you must go alone. There, there are some things you have to deal with alone. There, 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 there are some things you've got to deal with where you can't hide behind others. Yeah. You know people that hide behind others. They, they act like they're good and they act like they're all right, but they're really not. Uh, it, it amazed us. It took us a while to really realize that uh, our older dog, Ebony, was losing her hearing. Because when she would be outside and she and Duke would be outside, you could open the door and call them. And because he would get up and move, she'd start to run. But if they were in different parts of the yard, you'd be calling both of them. And she's somewhere chilling because she was hiding her deafness behind his ability to hear. And I come to tell some of y'all, you're just like Ebony. Lord, you're sweet, but you're deaf. And the issue is you're hiding behind others instead of recognizing I got to deal with my own stuff. I got to deal with this myself. Jesus goes a little bit further. The text says, and the Bible said he goes from walking to kneeling to eventually falling prostrate before God. Oh, God. He, he goes from walking to kneeling, to lying prostrate. I don't think you see it. He goes from walking upright to kneeling, to laying down. 
Somebody's got to catch this. Real prayer takes you from walking upright in pride to kneeling under your burdens to laying in the face of God you've not had real prayer and communion until you can get prostrate before God as long as you're walking Monique you're still walking and I got this and Lord you just touch it and I'll fix it but there comes a time when you've got to bow down and say this is getting the best of me humble myself to it Admit, I've got some problems. I need some help. And then if I say, Lord, I'm in your presence. I'm stretched out. I lay before you because you have just what I need. He, he lays before the Father. And he is in reverence and in adoration. And notice his prayer. His prayer is very revealing. He, he keeps it real, Lady Davis. He, he, he keeps it real, but real does not get him fixed. He, he keeps it 100, but keeping it 100 does not fix the problem. We, we live, Deacon Wade, we live in a world where everybody wants you to be authentic and keep it real. And, and, and if you don't say the first thing that comes out to your mind, you're not real. But sometimes the first thing that comes to my mind is real but not right. All right, I don't have the right church here. I guess, all, I guess all the real right folks stayed at home today. This is just the real folk. Some, sometimes the first thing that comes to my mind, you don't want me to say, and I'm the pastor, you don't want me to say the first thing that came to my mind because you never come back. Lord have mercy. You, you'd be like, whoo, child, did he just say, he, me, he keeping it real. No, how dare he tell me I'm a fool and I'm crazy. How, no, 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 you got to fix it up. Well, have you considered? There comes a time when you keeping it real will drive you crazy. He, he's real because he says...